thanks Adam for the uh, introduction um, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this um, month's uh, da, da, uh, dinner with Dharma. Um, this is a, a nice little group and um, I hope that uh, today we'll be able to um, have a you know, friendly discussion. Um, I think uh, there's quite a few of us here actually you know, associated with the temple and uh, I think uh, you'll probably be able to help me facilitate some of the discussions that we're going to have. So as uh, Ellen mentioned, um, we are actually going through um, this book, Where is the Way? Humanistic uh, Buddhism for Everyday Life by uh, Venerable Master Sing Yun, uh, the founder of Four Guan Chan, and also obviously uh, this chapter, uh, uh, this um, uh, center and the subchapters. Um, and this uh, is uh, his picture, if you haven't actually yeah, get to actually know what the Venerable Master looks like, and uh, it's because of him that we're here today. So uh, we should be very grateful that um, he's actually done a lot, not just for Buddhism, but also um, for the, um, you know, the community and making sure that everyone uh, can you know, be able to practice Buddhism and have a full and correct understanding of Buddhism. So I'll just um, go on to the next slide. So um, I'll just quickly run through um, what we'll, we'll do um, today. Um, I realize that today is also Earth Hour, so uh, I've been told that we need to uh, try to turn my finish well before 8.30 and uh, make sure that they don't switch off their lights. So, um, <laughs> and, and do our bit as a sort of like a global citizen. Uh, but in terms of uh, what we're covering today, um, yeah, I'll just basically, um, as Stella mentioned, that I'll um, go through parts of uh, Venerable Master's book and in particular the first chapter about the Four Noble Truths. Um, and um, yeah, if some of you are already Buddhists, you probably know what that is. Um, but I would like to um, actually present it in a way that you know how does that actually relate um, to our lives and our modern day life? You know, because uh, when the Buddha first gave the teaching, that was almost two thousand six hundred years ago. Um, but it's still as relevant today as probably is two thousand six hundred. That's very powerful, and and we. I think we have to understand why that's the case. And um, I think that's quite interesting and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Now we, have, we do have a quite a small group, so ask questions. Um, so I'd like everyone just to, yeah, if you want to make a comment, do put up your hand and uh, yeah, we'll have questions uh, along the way. And uh, I just want to make this as uh, friendly and uh, make it very comfortable so that we can actually um, have, a, have a good discussion. And, I think one of the things about uh, learning Buddhism is that um, it's not just, uh, I mean obviously you have to do, do a self-study yourself, but I think a discussion uh, and actually um, the questions that you bring up uh, actually help you learn along the way. So I do encourage uh, lots of questions and I think the success of this um, today's talk will be based on you know, how well people actually interact. Um, so again, uh, with the questions participating in the uh, discussions, um, then I'd like to also um, share some of, um, I guess, the life stories and, and experiences. Um, uh, that's also, I think, one of the things um, that's quite, you know, special about uh, learning uh, Buddhism and having a, uh, I guess, like a family, like BLIA and the temple, that you literally grew up, grew up I actually um, grew up with the temple and uh, with all the volunteers and all the people around you. Uh, they help you along the way, and I'd like to share some of my experiences uh, along the way, and uh, hopefully encourage you to uh, do the same. Um, and the, the the most important part is actually you know reflect on um, you know what we've learned and you know, having that share, um, sharing. And I think um, it is quite important that um, we do share uh, what what we learn. Um, we all come from um, you know, different walks of life. Every one of us here has a different story. Everyone has a, uh, if you want to sit down, everyone, you know, it's literally, there must be a book in everyone. You know, you want to actually buy a book about yourself. And, uh, and I think being able to share all your experiences, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, your friends and you know, people, uh, then it's also a way to reflect up upon yourself and see you know, how you can actually improve. So that's um, roughly, you know, the, uh, the agenda. And these are some of the questions that I think um, 
we, we should just keep in mind, and, and I actually have the questions first but at the end, because I think going through some of these slides, um, I think it's important that you, you have some of these things in, uh, in mind. And the first question is, what is Buddhism? So what is it? I mean, there's, um, I think I had a chat with uh, Austin just during dinner, you know. There's, uh, especially if you're coming from an uh, Asian background, um, you may know what Buddhism is about. But um, until you actually study it, uh, you'll find that in fact there's actually uh, you know, Chinese culture, Korean culture as, as well. There's actually a lot of culture that's actually intermixed with Buddhism. And you know, over the two thousand, two and a half thousand years, um, I guess some of the uh, message might have uh, blended in. You know, and people are now not exactly sure. You know, what's Buddhism, what's Confucianism, Taoism, etc. So I think um, it's just good to keep that in mind. Uh, we are talking about the form of the truth, so that is, um, I guess, uh, the core teaching of Buddhism. And that's a bit of a giveaway. But the form, the form of the truth is, in fact, the core teaching uh, given by uh, the Buddha. The next one is interesting. Humanistic Buddhism. So what is humanistic Buddhism? Sounds a bit, you go, oh, okay, Buddhism. Mm. I, I always thought that Buddhism is like, you know, you go out in the mountains, you meditate, and then you, be, you become this um, Buddha and you, uh, you have some sort of supernatural powers or something. Um, I say that you know, you're too much uh, TV you know, if you uh, believe that's the case. But how does actually Buddhism uh, relate um, to, to, the, to the modern day world? You know? Actually coming back, uh, not, I mean, the, the practice, yes, is very important you know, to actually go in uh, yeah, meditation, etc. And that's very uh, self practice. But how do you actually? Uh, apply that practice right, in, our, uh, in our daily lives and I think that's a crux of um, the humanistic Buddhism. Then, um, who is uh, Venerable Master Sing Yun? Very good question. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll actually talk a little bit about him. And I think if you actually um, read his life story, I think you'll definitely be moved and you'll be very touched and you understand where he's coming from and um, you'll or for myself, I definitely say, well, what can I do you know, to, to contribute, you know, just so that um, I can carry on some of the, um, the grand vows and the wishes that um, the Grand Master actually um, envisaged. Like, he has this great vision of how to propagate Buddhism, not just in his lifetime, but for the next 4,800 years. And I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, and then, you know, what does it mean actually to become a Buddhist? And uh, you know, where is the way? So where is the way coming back to the book? But you know, there's um, uh, what what uh, how how do we actually get there? So these are some of the questions that I think people should uh, you know contemplate, or everyone should contemplate uh, while we actually have this discussion. Um, I uh, yeah, I just briefly touched on the fact that yeah, I mean, there's a a lot of like. I guess misconceptions about what Buddhism is about, and uh, there's always this thing about you know. I mean, uh, people when they relate Buddhism, the first thing is that meditation. And meditation, yes, that's right, that is a practice. But you know, people do come in and say, okay, meditation means that you have to basically close off from the world, and you basically um, you know sit there and you meditate, you know, as long as you can, and um, and then try to sort of like somehow um, you know better yourself that way. And to a, to a, um, if you're just purely looking at um, how to approach it, that is definitely a very important component. Um, but this idea of um, you know um, closing yourself off from everyone and um, and just basically in solitude, um, I think we sort of need to correct that a little bit. I mean, there is parts of that, but in fact, um, one of the core things about the um, practicing Buddhism and especially we're going to this idea of uh, humanistic Buddhism is that we actually have to um, do, uh, you know, put the practice uh, into our daily lives and do an involved life. So involved life uh, is a life that not only studies Buddhist teaching but also be able to apply it in our daily lives. And I think being able to apply it in daily lives is um, what everyone, you know, is, it, 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 like, it's like the holy grail, you know. I mean, how do you actually relate a sitting meditation and how do you actually move into 
actually using what you've learned during your sitting uh, meditation in your everyday practice. Now, I'll probably just go through briefly about um, a little bit about this book. I was asked to just give an introduction so that people uh, will have an idea. And I just thought I'd run through um, the book, which has 16 chapters. Uh, it's divided into four sections. Uh, the first section is about you know, waking up. And this is where um, you know, all the, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, fundamental core teachings of the, of the Buddha. Um, you know, they have uh, seven, uh, about four, set, uh, four different chapters on that. Uh, the living in the world, staying on the way, and moving forward on the Dharma journey. So if you look at this as a whole, it is actually a, uh, a blueprint of how to actually apply uh, Buddhism in our daily lives. And um, the first part of it, you know, the waking up, um, it talks about the Four Noble Truths, which is what I'm going to cover today. Um, there's other topics which is fundamental to the uh, Buddhist teachings, uh, cause and effect, um, about knowledge uh, and religion. Uh, and then the next section, I could just go through how to bring the Buddhist um, teachings into our everyday world, and, you know, on emotions, on loving kindness and compassion, uh, on ethics and mor morality, and also on society. So one thing that is actually um, I found very um, useful about the book is that it actually gives you a lot. It gives you a lot of um, uh, practical uh, examples, uh, ca practical um, questions that you may have, and it gives you obviously gives you the answers mm -hmm. to a certain extent. So that's why I think um, yeah, it's a it's a good book to have. If you, I would like to learn more about Buddhism. Um, then going forward, uh, the staying on the way um, you know, chapters on uh, education, and entertainment. Uh, long life, wealth and happiness, um, government and international affairs and, and on nature. So, I mean, this is also the other um, the, the other thing about misconception, I guess, of like, Buddhism that, you know, you have to sort of like somehow, you know, live uh, a life of poverty and, yeah, not to have any sort of worldly pleasure, etc. And I think um, um, the Venerable Master actually explained a lot about um, what, what that is about and uh, how you can actually, uh, you know, wealth and what wealth can actually do, you know, like, I think um, it's more about wealth and how you can actually use that wealth for, to benefit um, the greater society, not just yourself, and how you actually get uh, happiness uh, based on doing that. So, wealth itself is not something that you should, you know, stay away from, oh, I'm a Buddhist now, so therefore I have to live in a lot of poverty, but it's actually about how you can actually use your, uh, I guess, um, the intelligence, your knowledge in um, uh, uh, our daily lives, you try as hard as you can, be as successful as you can. But then, and obviously, you know, in this world, uh, obviously, if you're being successful, I mean, the wealth comes. And, uh, and how do you actually then you know, use the wealth to actually um, uh, benefit others? You know? so, so there's you know, things on, on, on that of how to actually um, um, so we like some of um, the, the some of the questions that people may have yeah, about uh, Buddhism and practicing Buddhism. Um, then yeah, moving forward on the Dharma journey. Um, so on the Triple Gem uh, ceremony, the five precepts, uh, Buddhism and democratic principles, and um, on the uh, on the future. So this is really about formalizing uh, yourself to become a Buddhist. And what does it mean? Right. And um, one of the first steps is obviously uh, taking the, uh, the refuge and uh, the triple gem. This idea that you have the baptism is like the first step that you do um, to actually say, well, I'm going to be a Buddhist and uh, I'm going to um, obey the teachings or I'm going to learn about the teachings and actually practice the teaching. And just putting that first step forward to actually committing yourself to taking um, the, uh, the refuge and then the precepts the subsequent precepts, I think that's uh, very important. And that is why um, that section talks about the moving forward on, um, on a Dharma journey. And I think it is very important. Um, and I, I do hear a lot about people saying that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm okay, I come to the temple, I don't think I can, um, um, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm ready to take the refuge. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 I'm sort of uh, in agreement with the Buddhist teaching. I mean, 
Why can't you that's true, but if you do agree with it, then why don't you just take that first step? Right? So it's all about you know making that commitment. You know? and, and if you don't make a commitment then you know someone will say, well yes you you you, you sort of like act in the right way, but you know, people are not not hundred percent sure you know where you stand. So I think some of these stuff um, and, and I'll sort of uh, um, touch on it a little bit later on uh, as well, just to um, hopefully um, you know help you have a bit understanding. By the way, uh, how many people have taken the refuge here? And the precepts? So yes, I will go very young. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, okay, so. Um, so the part one, um, the part one starts off with um, this little um, verse from the humble table, wise bed, uh, on inspiration. So it says, the real treasure of energy is not in the mountains of, or in the oceans, but in one's own mind. And the real treasure of the Dharma is not in the uh, sutras or in the mouth, but in one's own mind. Now, I think this is this is actually very powerful, and you probably set yourself up in the right way to actually understand this um, this section and this chapter. And the emphasis here is that it is all, all in our mind and how we actually uh, control our minds. And uh, this is the, the crux of um, the Buddhist teaching: um, is being able to have that self-control. I mean, we our, our minds wander so easily. You know, someone if the mobile phone goes quickly, you know, someone can just switch and you'll drop everything from what you're doing and then you switch. So how do we actually stay focused at the present time and doing the uh, thing that you, you're supposed to do? Uh, I think that is um, the cost of the practice as well. Now the Four Noble Truths, I think uh, you probably see a lot of text about what this Four Noble Truths is about, but I'll, I'll do this one with uh, my pictures. So can anyone tell me what the, uh, maybe this is the first Noble Truth. What do you think the first thing I'm sure is uh, talking about? Yeah, so, I can't really know someone you know, crying. So. It is about, yeah, so the first thing I'm sure is about uh, yeah, suffering. Okay, the next one. What's this? So, I've got a nice green fill, uh, but you know, lots of pieces of rubbish. A bit of uh, flies over there. Yes, 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 that's, that, that, that is correct, yeah, so it's more like, I mean, I was just trying to find a good picture, uh, not <laughs> but he's actually talking about the accumulation, and yeah, so he's talking about um, how we actually get to the point of, uh, of suffering, so I guess when the, when the, when the cousin character in the previous slide saw this, you know, wow, this uh, looks like a bit of a mess, and uh, yeah, so obviously it's not very, very good. So the next slide, so what's that? Yeah, so this is a much prettier picture, right? The rubbish is not there anymore. Right, so this is um, yeah, that sensation which is like, there, there is actually a way for you to um, remove the rubbish. Right? If you remove the rubbish, behind the rubbish there is actually a very pretty picture. The last one? Meditation. Meditation. Yeah. So, this is like you know, how you actually get there. So, the Four Noble Truth actually is, is quite interesting. I mean, it's actually a, a cause and effect and cause and effect. So, if you think about um, how the way uh, the Buddha actually organized this, um, he's actually saying that, okay, the, uh, he actually reversed it. He, he should have said that. Um, the, the, um, you know, because you have suffering, the reason for suffering is because you know you, you have uh, accumulation of all these uh, you know the food poisons, and I'll cover that a bit. And so that's like an um, an uh, effect. Sorry, that's a cause. And then the the suffering is because you know you see the rubbish and you go, oh gee, what am I going to do? And 
and then that's how the effect. In the same way, uh, you can say that um, this is actually the cause, which is like you go and uh, meditate, and therefore you actually get to the end. So um, there's actually an interesting story why the, uh, the Buddha actually uh, turned it. Rather than saying the cause and effect, and cause and effect, he actually said effect, cause, effect, and cause. And the reason why the Buddha actually reversed it, and, and that's actually quite interesting when I, so I read about it, is that the reason why is because most people uh, don't actually see the future. Like people are fixated at the moment, they only see the initial problem. So that's why the, the Buddha, you know, and you can see that the Buddha is a, is a very skillful uh, communicator. And he actually just thought about how he can reverse it because if he talks about, um, you know, that you have to do this, that you have to go and practice all the way, you go, oh, geez, this doesn't look very interesting. But he showed you the picture of the green valley because he said, oh, this is really, this is something that I should aim for. And how do you get there? You know, you just like dangling the, the carrot and say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll definitely like to be over there, which is much prettier. And therefore, um, you say, okay, so you want to get there you have to, um, you know, um, basically do the practice. Yeah. So that's the full picture. I hope that that's uh, helped you sort of understand or remember uh, about the, uh, the Four Noble Truths. Um, I will actually, yeah, so I'll just, yeah, this is just a, a slide just summarizing um, those four pictures. So the first one is about um, life is full of suffering. Uh, suffering is caused by our attachments. Uh, it, it's the one where, you know, and I'll go a little bit about why the, the attachment become you know, a pile of rubbish. Uh, and then the, the awakening or the complete liberation of suffering is possible. So you see the, the pretty picture, so we can actually uh, get there. And to um, that there is a way, if, um, through the Buddhist teaching, that we can actually become uh, awakened so that we can get into that pretty picture. So the next slide. Um, yeah, so some, some people may say that, you know, up to now, and say, well, um, is life really full of suffering? I mean, we're seeing here, I mean, I don't think everyone's suffering right now. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone's not suffering. Anyway, suffering. Um, I mean, if most of us have our basic needs, you know, we're all, we're living the, a very, a very stable country, there's nothing we need to worry about, there's no war, they can live in harmony and peace. So why, why does um, the Buddha say that, you know, people are actually in, in uh, you yeah, know, ha having suffering? Has anyone wondered why that's the... Everyone's got their own attachments that eventually can cause you suffering. You don't see that they are attachments. They? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's got their own sort of attachments and their own sort of issues, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. Any other? You're destined to get older and sicker and die. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Certain things can't escape from basically. Yeah, that's right. No one goes through life without being sick or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so you're touching on this uh, this eye of, of the uh, of suffering because ultimately uh, we all have this thing, this uh, focus about ourselves. And uh, in the book, you actually expand that a little bit more and talks about how because the self or ourself is not in harmony with um, with uh, uh, the material world. So you know we 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 are always paying for materialistic things, you know, clothing or um, it could be on you know, every I think 18 months there will be a new new phone that you might want to actually buy because it's got some fancy features. So everyone is actually ch chasing uh, the material um, sort of like um, um, the, the, the materialistic side of the things. Um, and there's also um, I guess um, the touch on about the, uh, the harmony with other people. So we may not get along with people. I mean, um, even sometimes, you know, uh, with family members and all that. You know, and supposedly friends, you know, there may be something that they say and then you, you 
get upset and things like that. So while we all live in obviously a, a greater community, starting from the family, you know, people do have distances. Um, this itself is not in harmony with the body. So uh, sorry, your name. Uh, Paul. Paul just mentioned previously about yeah people yeah uh, through sickness and uh, people do die and so um, these are the things that you know the self is not in harmony with um, and yeah and also delusional thoughts uh, we have um, a lot of you know, our mind always wander, uh, wanders to different places but, um, you know there's just some little distraction and then we'll we'll move away and. Um, and therefore we would, would, would not focus. Um, desires, views, and also nature. And um, these are like all the sort of like the eye of the, uh, of the suffering. And because we all have this uh, focus uh, of having the, the, the eye, or if you like, um, you know, we, we have the ego, uh, because we are actually uh, self-aware. We know who we are, and we get attached to that, and then um, we'll build up this suffering. So, but, you know, suffering aside, and, uh, but the Buddha does tell me, to tell us that, you know, we shouldn't be despair because there are ways actually to overcome it, and that's actually uh, what the, uh, the full noble truth is, uh, is about. So, um, so the, uh, the second noble truth is that, uh, in fact, our suffering is, um, is actually caused by our own karma. But does everyone know what, what karma is? Yes? Cause and conditions? Yep. Can we expand on how to cause and conditions? The effect of um, one's doing or thinking or doing thoughts, speech yep. and action? Yep. Okay. Other, yeah, you hear about karma in the uh, popular um, culture a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting, I guess, uh, because both of you probably have the Buddhist background. Because the first thing that you hear about karma, people always is a negative connotation mm -hmm. of karma, but there's actually both positive and negative. It's all about, you know, people do talk about, oh, uh, if you do something bad, then something will happen to you again. It's like a you know, like retribution. And I and I think that should also be corrected that yeah, there's also uh, positive karma, not just negative karma, even though in, in, in the popular culture people do associate the, um, the karma with something negative. Um, the next point is very important about um, karma is not something that disappears, it only accumulates. And that's, uh, that's a very, very interesting point because, you know, there's so many things that happen in our lives that it's very hard even to keep up with um, things that happened last yesterday or last week, <laughs> let alone you know, any of your um, things that you've done maybe last year or five years ago or ten years ago. What this is saying is that everything that you do is actually um, carried with you. And, um, and, that's, and then some people say, well, not really. I mean, you sort of like just do something like that. Forget about it, right? But if you look at it a little bit deeper, in fact, it's more than that because a lot of the things that we do are actually part of our habit. And if you think about it, it's the, the karma is a little bit about it's like people with bad habits. People have good habits as well, but people have bad, you know, things that you, if you constantly do something, right? And that's when the, the karma you know, just accumulates with you. So you may not even know yourself that you're a cynical person. I mean, nowadays, you know, every time when someone says, oh, let's go and do this, and even if it's very noble, someone in the corner will say, oh, you know, it's too hard, no one's going to listen to you. People will just automatically tell you 10, 10 reasons why it can't be done, or things uh, can't be achieved. Right? So we all be in that situation. So again, yeah, this is, you know, this, um, so the karma is like, yeah, this, this, this uh, concept of being, um, things that are sort of like accumulating um, is actually quite important. These things that um, just happen sort of like in the background and you may not even know, you know, but if 
it's something that you do again and again, you repeat and you don't do it, and then suddenly it becomes a habit, then um, yeah, that's not very good. So this is why um, this is what I'm sort of leading to to say, you know, we're actually driven by the uh, afflictions of greed, anger, and ignorance, or collectively they're called the three poisons. So the Buddha um, gave the analogy that the reason why we we suffer is because we are constantly by driven by these these three things. You know, we have greed. You know, we see something that oh we like, you know, oh, this food that I like, I might, might take a little bit more. Or um, you know, we get angry. You know, someone say something that uh, or criticizes you, um, you, you, you'll get angry. Or you have some sort of delusion, delusional thoughts. So that's ignorance. And you think that, oh, you know, I, I love, to, uh, that actually reminds me of, of a story about uh, there was a, there was a, a kid that um, the mother told him to, um, you know, take the eggs that they had in the farm and you know, to market to the sell. And, um, and this, uh, and, and the, uh, as a point of encouragement, the mother told the, the child to say, okay, for this time, whatever eggs that you sell, you can go and give the money. And um, the kid obviously is very happy to say, oh, okay, I can actually get some more pocket money then. So he was uh, balancing the, the basket of eggs and just walking along. And he, he starts thinking about, oh, how if he sells the chicken, uh, uh, if he sells the eggs, then uh, he's going to make some profit. They go, oh, but hang on. If I save some eggs and hash them into chicks, and then the chicks can produce more eggs, I can even make more money, you know. But, so in his mind, he's already planning all this stuff, you know, saying, oh, geez, how am I going to be really wealthy and rich from this basket of eggs? And, uh, and then suddenly, when, when he was just walking, I think someone just scared him, and all the eggs just dropped, and everything's just gone out, you know. So <laughs> the analogy is that, yeah, I mean, that happens, actually, in our lives all the time, that we, we, we are all... So like having all this mind about, we're all planning ahead, we're all thinking about things, you know, all ahead of the past, or rather than actually focusing on the present. So these are the, the three poisons, and, um, and not just because we have these poisons, that we have um, the attachment. So I think Paul also mentioned that um, because we have this attachment to it, that we are actually fixated, we keep on in this, um, what they call this uh, cycle of birth and rebirth. So we're continuing the cycle and we're never uh, liberated. Now, where there is people celebrate birthdays, you know, at, at the birth of a child, but, you know, when someone is born, someone has to <laughs> die and disappear and go through the, uh, the sickness and the whole cycle. So while we get sort of like a temporary uh, happiness, um, that happiness is not permanent. You know, it actually is it's, it's impermanent and, and things do move. And that's something that, you know, um, I guess um, every one of us here, everyone has to deal with, and, um, and, and, it, and, and that's actually why you know, we, we're actually constantly in this uh, birth and, um, and rebirth, and hence um, you know, we're actually suffering. So the thing and which is leading to the, uh, the third one, which we've said, yeah, is to actually have to actually eliminate these afflictions. Uh, so eliminating the uh, the affliction means um, you know, going to nirvana. So nirvana is a state in which you break yourself out from this um, cycle of birth and, uh, and rebirth. And it's interesting, when I try to find a picture of nirvana, the only thing I can do, I can find, is actually the band. But that's a different story. So, um, so nirvana, well, yeah, maybe the, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not into their music that much, but nirvana is actually the liberation. So after understanding the truth, of, um, of suffering and removing uh, these causes. So, um, it is actually what um, what all Buddhists want to strive for. So now I'm going to ask everyone uh, a, a question. So, everyone wants to be liberated. So what happens after you're liberated? Um, yeah, that, that is actually um, interesting and 
is actually is still actually a well, I always say that it's still a, a, a cyclic thing that you don't actually break away. I mean, um, if you think about what the uh, Buddha actually had done, I mean, he become enlightened, and um, did he actually just um, go on his merry ways and just say, "Well, see you later, guys. I'm I'm in Nirvana now. I'm happy." No, he didn't. He actually came back and he actually spent the next 49 years actually teaching, and he actually had. Um, you know, the compassion and the love for everyone. Right? So that's um, something that is um, also very important to keep in mind that, you know, while sort of the goal is to break out of um, the birth and rebirth and that we, uh, we, we seek liberation, but this liberation means that it would give us um, a way to, um, to control our own destiny. To, to actually be able to be in control, rather than based on our, our karma. So our karma is things that are basically forced because of the habit, you get just pushed along the way. But once you're actually enlightened, once you're, you're liberated, then you get to choose where you want to go. And where is that? And that is to helping others, helping more people to actually come and become liberated. So that's um, that's the core one of the um, the core teachings, um, and yeah, I, I mentioned about the uh, the state of oneness, and it's, it's yeah, it's basically about yeah, becoming free. Um, yeah, what they call the ultimate, you know, the, the, the real happiness. It's not something that you know people go you know, um, celebrating and they say, oh, I'm really happy at this moment. But it's actually a a real type of heaven. It's like they often use the word joy. It's a it's a uh, it's a joy that comes out of you once you uh, become liberated. Um, yeah. So the four noble truth. Yeah. So the, there's um. So the four the, the four noble truth. The fourth noble truth is about the, uh, the noble eightfold path. So this is really. Um, a way to to say you know what we need to do to actually um, what we should do in our practice to achieve our liberation and um, there's this will and this um, you know the eight points and I'll just um, go go through it briefly so um, the first thing is the the right view and obviously that's very important and I think that's why everyone of us is here you know we actually want to know what the truth is like um, yeah, there's a lot of people who uh, preach, um, you know, Buddhism and, and, and its ideals. And in fact, in a lot of the um, um, the, the public uh, motivational speakers, etc., you know, people actually have taken, I guess, you know, um, a lot of our Buddhist teaching, but you know, without giving the Buddha credit and just putting it on their own thing. And while I think um, it's not, maybe they're not saying anything bad or anything that's uh, incorrect. But yeah, a lot of people don't realize that those teachings that could come from uh, the teaching of the Buddha. So having the, the right view and the right understanding and things like the idea about um, cause and effect and uh, things being impermanent, uh, these are all um, you know, the, the right view, the views that you should have when, when you're actually studying uh, Buddhism. Uh, the next point is the, the right intentions or the right thoughts. So this is um, so that you, you don't actually um, you know try to use the um, the Buddhist teaching in a in a false way or try to convince people to you know do some evil. You, know. you always want to um, use it for the right intentions. Um, then the right speech. Then obviously you want to be able to um, have the compassion and like you know, giving um, talks. To, uh, you know, to facilitate talks and uh, to actually um, tell people more about the Dharma because uh, it is actually um, a very uh, important and powerful teaching and in fact I think if the, um, if the school system um, can actually adopt some of these stuff, I mean sometimes you can think that um, yeah, we'll definitely have a better society because I think the, the schooling system today is more about you know, skills, about how you um, 
um, actually use uh, knowledge from uh, from you know, your mathematics, your science, and all that to actually yeah, earn a living. But I think some of the morality and all that kind of stuff uh, also comes into play. Uh, the next one is the right actions. So um, this is basically having the uh, correct conduct. So uh, touching on the, the precepts, uh, being you know no killing, um, no stealing, uh, being honourable, and uh, no uh, you know being you know, taking drugs or being intoxicated. So um, and then the right livelihood to uh, actually learn a living without uh, causing harm to others and having respect for life. The right effort is very important because that's actually mean that we want to be diligent in your practicing. Um, and then the right concentration. So you can see that as we go on to these um, eight points, we actually you know, come to you know, the, um, the idea of you know, getting rid of our, our food poisons and being less attached to them or no attachment to them and therefore moving forward and be, become liberated. So being able to um, having the right concentration and then the right mindfulness. So uh, next slide. So um, I put this one as a bit of a yeah. The, uh, here's the end. Uh, no, it's actually a, there's a question mark. So <laughs> um, so it, it's at the end. Like some, if you want to know about uh, Buddhism and uh, what the uh, Buddha actually taught, that's pretty much it. There's only the four noble truths. I mean, obviously he uh, had you know, sutras and had lots and lots of thoughts. He had a lot of um, things just to basically communicate in a skillful way to convince different walks of life how to actually uh, do the practice. So, you know, the, um, the, uh, the four noble truths yeah, is the, the foundation of all the teachings and you can always refer back to it. And, um, yeah, so fortunately or unfortunately for you, yeah, this is not the end of the talk yet. So I'll, before I go on to the importance of the, um, of the Noble Jar, I might just show you a, a short video on, on the life of Buddha. So just in case um, you may not have the, the background of who the Buddha was, I think this, um, this is a quite nice video just to talk about how the Buddha actually got in life. So let me just um, cut to that one. Very uh, cinematic, isn't it? <laughs> I always, yeah, when I was uh, preparing this uh, last night, I was looking at it and uh, I was in awe. So I just come back to the point that, um, you know, when the Buddha did actually get enlightened, then technically, you know, he's liberated. You know. Does anyone know what, what the Buddha did when, when he became enlightened? After, after he became enlightened, what's the first thing he did? <coughs> Anyone with the answer? Wasn't there some kids around who just talked or something? Or he just sat there and relaxed? Well, maybe he was relaxing, I don't know. I wasn't there. No. Uh, yeah. no. Yeah. Now, the first thing he actually did was he actually went back and tried to find the uh, five aesthetics that he practiced with. He actually went back and uh, traced back in to a place called Deep Park, which is um, uh, the north of um, present day India. And uh, he actually still had those uh, people in his mind. And the story goes that the, uh, the aesthetics that he was practicing with. So does everyone know what the aesthetics are? Do you know who they are? These are the people who um, live in the mountains. And they believe basically that you, you have to live in a, in a state where you, know, you only have to, can have you know, one grain of rice and one uh, berry a, a, a day. <laughs> And then you sit there and you meditate and you basically uh, don't do anything. Right? And that's the way you become enlightened. So the Buddha actually um, uh, followed the aesthetics uh, for quite, quite a number of years. I think it was like six or seven years. He was living with it. Nine years. Yeah. Nine years. Yeah. So he, he actually followed that practice for nine years. But did he get enlightened? No. Yeah. So he actually... Uh, left and then um, he 
he actually, and the aesthetics who were still in the, in the mountains there, when, when he came back, he goes, he thinks that he, um, he couldn't take it. He thought the Buddha, you know, he knew that he was a, a prince, and that, but they always thought that, oh, you know, you're, you, you couldn't actually uh, handle the, the practice, and then you, he, they all thought that he, uh, he went back to a palace, but obviously he didn't. So when he came back after enlightenment, he then actually preached the Four Noble Truths to them, and they actually be, become enlightened themselves, the, the, um, those um, five aesthetics. I think if you have um, put that into context of um, what Buddhism try to teach us is that, and I think that is a very important point, is that after you actually understood the, um, the meaning of the Dharma and what the Buddha teaches you, the first thing you really have to do is um, actually just help others to understand. I think that's. Um, that's quite, I mean, most people just say, oh yeah, I, I, I would like to be, you know, study Buddhism so I can break out of the cycles, I, be, I don't have to be suffered. But in fact, I think after you get liberated, then I think the, the idea of, um, you know, having this vow to try to save or save as many people as you can, try to liberate uh, as many people as you can, and, and share that sense of joy with as many people as you can, I think. That is, uh, that's, that's very powerful. And I think everyone should just keep that in mind, you know, when they do do their practice, that this is the ultimate goal to be able to, um, to actually use what you've actually been taught. So I'll go on to the next slide about um, a few things about the importance of uh, the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths is also about the, um, the first turning of the, uh, the Dharma wheel. And it's meant to be instructive. So what we've talked about tonight is really just, is a, I guess, um, telling you the, the theory and the facts of you know, how to actually get there. So it's like, um, if you like, it's, it's instructive, it's like education. The second turning of the Dharma wheel was to provide encouragement for his disciples. So that was a little bit later on when he did actually speak about the form of the truth. He actually want his uh, disciples to uh, continue the practice and that, you know, um, everyone can uh, be liberated. And then finally, the third turning of the um, Dharma wheel is when uh, the Buddha shared his uh, realization. And, um, and that is also another thing that um, is uh, very, very uh, important about the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha, even after he has been enlightened, when he was living, and then he went back and he had the disciples and he was living with the community, right? he actually behaved Equally, he, he behaved in the same way as everyone. He still went out, went out for his arms round. Right? He's a Buddha now, right? So technically, he's a respected, as it were, more respected person. But he still did his daily um, uh, arms round to, to, to beg for food. Right? He still does his meditative practice every day, and he still does teach. Right? So if you put all that into context, you can say, oh, "Okay, how should I?" behave as Buddhas as well. If uh, Buddhism is what you seek and uh, you want to be more like Buddha because the Buddha is supposed to be enlightened, liberated, um, he doesn't have any afflictions and worries, how does he live and how should I live? So there should be a, a bit of back and forth and try to emulate the practice of, uh, of the Buddha. Um, so, um, yeah, moving on is the, um, like, uh, how to actually um, put the, uh, the Four Noble Truths into, into practice. And there's the Four Universal Vows. And the, and the, and the vows uh, is saying that, you know, we must resolve, cultivate, and practice accordingly. And I think this is something that is um, also very important, is that um, Buddhism, once you, as I said before, it's at the end because technically know everything about Buddhism now, is that the end? Right? It's really about um, doing the practice and actually keeping up and uh, being consistent. Um, it's a bit like the, um, yeah, something that you have to, you know, you have to keep your exercise up because otherwise, you know, you might have health issues. So everyone needs to do a little bit, everyone needs to practice, not just on a physical body, but also uh, 
on the spiritual side, on the, on the mind side, you have to actually uh, put that work in. Uh, I think today a lot of people uh, go to the gym, so physically they're very fit, but sometimes you get them mentally. They have to yeah, do the same as well. So I think both needs to be balanced out. Um, and the four universal vows and six um, perfections uh, comprise a skillful means to uh, for us to achieve in the bar. So uh, six perfections um, you didn't really touch on here, but um, the, the the perfection is uh, things that we, we must practice every day, and these are like generosity. Uh, we have to have good morality, a virtue. Uh, we have, to have patience. Uh, we want to have diligence, concentration, and wisdom. So these are like tied in together with the uh, noble eightfold uh, path that we just talked about. Um, and this is also the crux of um, the Mayana, Mahayana Buddhism. Right, so, um, does everyone know what the uh, different branches of uh, Buddhism? There's Theravada, there's uh, Maya, Mahayana, there's uh, Vajrayana. So the um, and this is all like in relation to um, if you look at the north of India, I mean, the center of Buddhism, because that's where the Buddha came from. So we like the nor northern strand, and we do the um, our tradition is the uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, so we we focus more about um, you know the practice of the Bodhisattva. So does everyone know what the Bodhisattva means? Bodhisattva path. Any takers? So, I mean, maybe uh, I always just want to, um, you have to tie in with sort of like a Western um, concept of, you know, like, for example, in the, in the church you have saints and people who are doing a lot of things, and people who are, are very caring about the community, you know. A bodhisattva is, you can say, is people who, have, who do pra practice, um, you know, what, what I just mentioned, you know, the generosity is the, uh, uh, being uh, a, a, verse, a person of a high morality, um, yeah, just a sample for everyone to, to actually do, and, and the benef and their goal is to be able to benefit others, <coughs> right? not just for themselves, but also the others. So, um, so most of the um, the Chinese traditions are the Mahayana or the Northern Strand. Uh, the Theravada is the um, Southern Strand, which is uh, practiced by more uh, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka. So the south of um, India, um, and, uh, they have their tradition, and but the other one is Tibetan, Bhakvasha, Bhakvasha, which is uh, Tibetan. So they're the different traditions, but they're all basically, um, you know, follow the Buddhist teaching. And um, and what I mentioned before about um, actually taking that step and making a vow to uh, become a Bodhisattva. That's what our our goal is because uh, we not only want to liberate ourselves, but we also want to help liberate others. Um, and that is very important, the power of vows, because until you take that step and you make that commitment, um, you don't really, uh, I mean, it's just something that is really just in a book, or something that doesn't actually relate to you. I mean, today um, everyone lives in, um, I can say, you know, Definitely, people uh, in Australia and the developed world, people do live in luxury. You know, we have all our means now. We have energy, we have power. We can do a lot of things. It's the internet. Um, but yet, everyone's very stressed and everyone's very time poor. No one has any time. You know, I'm always very busy. I don't have any time for this. Yeah, I have 10 other things I have to do. But I think um, it comes back to uh, you actually have to make time. You have to actually shift priorities. You have to say not, um, you know, uh, being helping others or uh, doing something for the general community is not something that you do if you have spare time. It's something that you should do just by definition. <laughs> because ultimately, 
we're all in this uh, together. And I, I have another um, uh, discussion this afternoon actually with Lisa as well. Today, you know, I was um, in a city a few weeks ago. I see these people on their iPhones or um, phone, you know, looking up Google Map. There were literally hundreds of people around. But they wouldn't stop and just say, excuse me, where is such and such? I, I don't know where he was going, but he was just going through the, the Google Map. People now trust the technology, but will lose the human side of things. I mean, people are now like, you know, um, giving uh, you know, sad news of people passing you know, on Facebook, people you know, putting the sad faces. And, Sometimes when you think about all this, you go, is this really the humanity that we want to live in? Or are we just basically talking to a machine? Mm -hmm. right. So we, we actually have to, and, and people don't understand that behind that machine, there's actually a whole group of people actually controlling that machine. I mean, those people, those people decide not to actually maintain those machines and the servers that's behind Google, and it, we don't have the internet. But then we sort of like, in the we just say, oh yeah, we'll just get it from Google. But not actually knowing that, in fact, we are so dependent on each other. And, um, and I think that's just something that, yeah, we have to say, okay, um, we, we have to live in a better world, and hence we, um, we should actually make a bow, make a priority. We do what we can. Uh, I, think, I think everyone has different circumstances, but I think um, being able to uh, take, you know, an hour, you know, a few hours, a day, a day in a month, something like that. You know, you, you really have to set aside and just say, you know, this is what we're going to do. So that you can actually go and apply the, um, apply what you've learned from the Buddhism. And I'll, I'll go through a little bit more in, in the slide to follow the yeah, next one. So the four universal slides are, uh, uh, sorry, four universal vows on this slide. Um, so... The, the sentient beings are luminous. Uh, I vow to liberate them. So coming back to the, the idea of not just for self-benefit, I, I, I liberate myself, I wish Nirvana, see you later, happy lives. But it's actually helping others to come with you so that everyone will be able to enjoy. Uh, the afflictions are, are endless. And I vow to you, eradicate them. So obviously, uh, we, we're still in this life. We all have our habits or bad habits. Um, so we have to get rid of them and try to, uh, as much as possible, through the practice, be able to, um, to remove them. Because without removing them, this is like baggage. You know? As I say, this is the karma that you're actually lingering. And you know, one day, you, know, you might do something and um, you, you don't even notice because it's just basically something that you just do out of habit. Um, the teachings are infinite and I'm about to learn them. So... Um, the idea that, um, you know, while the form of the truth is uh, something that is um, the foundation of all, all Buddhism, um, there are still you know, lots of different sutras that we should actually um, be very diligent to be able to um, you know, learn as much as possible. And something about the, the Buddhist teaching is that, yeah, um, you know, attending talks and even so, you know, form of the truth, I think we've, obviously a, a lot of us have heard it many, many times, but actually um, getting different people's perspective on the same teaching, uh, reading it yourself. I mean, I always say that you should read the same thing again, you know, maybe every year or every couple of years. Because when you read it again, I will assure you that based on your experience, and if you do have that practice, that you will actually have a different interpretation. Um, some people, you know, the, the great masters, you know, they can tell you a lot, you know, you go to their lectures and some people go ding and the light bulb comes up, but some people not, not so, you know, it takes many goes before that light bulb comes on. Um, the Buddhahood is supreme and I'm about to attain it, so it's really just um, emphasizing that, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we should uh, follow the, um, the path so that we will one day become um, Buddhists ourselves. Now, I did touch a little bit about, um, you know, making vows and um, actually um, how to actually apply. And it's very important for us to be able to apply um, the things that we've learned in Buddhism, you know, in a practical sense. And this is where the humanistic Buddhism is about. Um, and it's really 
see the idea of um, Buddhists who can apply their meditative practice and Dharma teaching to the worldly issue. Um, and there's also sometimes referred to as engaged Buddhism. So it's really about um, being um, still while we're practicing the Buddhism, we uh, be able to uh, use that um, Buddhism for the greater good of, um, of mankind. And even though it's something that is small, maybe it's just your local community, but I can assure you that this is something that um, you know, it, it really helps, uh, not just um, you know, helping others, but also help yourself to understand a lot more about the teaching. Um, Venerable Master Sinyu, obviously the founder of Gu Guan Shan and um, all the, uh, sub, uh, you know, the sub-branches and branches, Nantian Temple is um, one of the branches of uh, Gu Guan Shan, which is um, headquartered in Taiwan. So we are actually very fortunate that um, the Venerable Master uh, decided to um, so I come to Australia back in 1990, I believe, and actually be able to uh, propagate the Dharma you know, to, the, to the West. So um, not just in Australia, but also in California, and I think in Europe as well. So we've now got um, you know, branch temples um, pretty much for uh, every corner of the world. And I think we should all be uh, very happy that we actually have this you know, very nice facility uh, to us, for us to learn and practice. Um, for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with um, Venerable Master Senior, I do have a short video about his life. And I think while you're watching this and you, you understand where he actually, um, how he actually, um, yeah, um, and how he actually uh, joined uh, Buddhism as a monk and um, how he actually um, sort of like got the, uh, the vow to propagate the uh, Buddhism through the building of, um, of temples and, and branches. Um, in fact, the, when Foghansong was uh, first um, created, it was meant to be an education uh, building. So you can see that um, the master's um, vision is, is about education. Like, while it may be easy to just build a few temples and we're talking about statues and um, and so forth, um, yeah, you you really about the um, yeah. So we'll go to the uh, the, the video. It's probably better explain. Is that touching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, yeah. If, once you understand, um, like the master, you know, going through the atrocities of uh, you know World War Two and living through poverty, and um, you can say that you know he's literally um, through the practice, he's basically you know liberated. I mean, he he still wants to come back and make sure that everyone um, have a place to study and have a place to uh, know about Buddhism. So. Um, and that's why um, the other part is very important is the Buddhist Light International Association, um, which I'm a member of and um, the Pashna is a sub-chapter of that organisation. So um, it's really a, um, a forum and a, I guess it's, you can say that it's a, it's a, um, a platform for uh, lay Buddhists like ourselves to be able to join an organisation and to be able to um, put the uh, Buddhist teaching uh, into practice. Um, it gives us a forum I and mean, we put on a lot of events uh, during the year. And through, through actually cooperating with um, all the volunteers to actually come together and put the events together, there's definitely a lot you learn. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I do remember, you know, there's um, yeah, lo lo lots of things, you know, from just some really, really small tasks that you, you, you may not, um, yeah actually do, you know, like setting up, for example, our um, you know, vegetarian stores and be able to do cooking, not just cooking for a few people, but for a few hundred people, um, actually cooking in a wok that's um, the size of a round table. So, you know, all that kind of stuff is uh, all very interesting. And I think um, one of the things that um, I do actually um, want to let people know is that there's always a lot of people when they do join some of these um, events, you know, Nowadays, there's a lot of um, 
sort of expertise that people have, you know, in their daily uh, lives. Right? They, they may be you know, accountants, doctors, etc. But uh, when you come and do a volunteer, you, you really have to put all that behind and actually be part of the group. And basically, you can, um, you know, um, uh, basically work together with very, very different people, and they all have different opinions. And you really have to put that aside and then to actually um, come together and actually put, put the event together. And then ultimately, you, you learn a lot about yourself. I think uh, yeah, those of you who, who uh, have been through, for example, the Buddha's birthday uh, um, event for the last you know, 20 years will probably know what I'm talking about. So it's, that is actually very, very important that you have that platform to actually uh, grow and develop. Um, so this is, uh, I'll just finish off with the, uh, the essence of learning and insight. So um, we rely on the Dharma and not the individual teachers. So uh, for things that you're taught, you know, always um, process it and uh, see whether or not it's actually uh, true uh, before you actually believe it. So don't rely on a person's status or whatever. You always um, go back and test um, the, uh, the Dharma to see whether or not you actually Joe's with uh, the Buddhist teaching. Uh, so rely on the meaning and not the words. So um, don't take things out of context. Exactly. And rely on the wisdom and not the uh, knowledge. So you know the the wisdom. You know, some I guess when, for myself, I always go, "Oh, wisdom is sort of like, oh, you've got to be really, really smart or something like that." But actually, wisdom has nothing to do with uh, how smart you are. It's uh, actually your understanding of. Um, um, Core Buddhist concepts, you know, the, uh, causing conditions, causing effects, impermanence, is how to actually apply these concepts in your daily life. And the more skillful you can do it, the more wisdom you have. Uh, and then we're relying on the uh, ultimate truth and not on the relative truth, which is obviously very important that the ultimate truth being, for example, the, the four noble truth. So, so that's, um, yeah, in, uh, in a nutshell, very quickly, I think. Um, in probably an hour and a half, I, uh, it's meant to be nine minutes, I didn't put on the time. Um, I didn't really have a specific discussion group. Um, I, I'm happy to, and, and he is actually at the end this time. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, I would like to, yeah, any, any, any questions? I, yeah. yeah, I'll be a little bit confused about um, the middle path. Yeah. Um, like, for example, how long, when he reached enlightenment, um, how long was he sitting for? Like, was it days or something when he decided he was going to get up or something? And I don't remember what day. 49 days? Yeah, it is 49 days. So, <laughs> see, that to me seems pretty extreme still. Mm. And so where does it fit in this whole... Because I can understand that the whole concept and you can't be too ascetic and you can't be, you know, be too self-indulgent. Yeah. That but seems to me you have to know that during that um, cycle, he was actually contemplating. He was... Yeah trying to understand it for himself. He, he, he wasn't enlightened then. He was in the process of it. And then I guess yeah, uh, something happened and he then realized that that's not the way to go. You shouldn't be too extreme. And that's what, um, what life is about. We really. talk about um, being able to get along with, um, with people, get along with the world. It's always the moderates, which uh, has a say. You don't really want to be too extreme on here. And this is very basic um, you know, philosophy anyway that you can actually apply. But certainly from the practice of Buddhism, yeah, that's how yeah, you stay on the middle path yeah. and be able to uh, be you know, still engaging and um, still involved with the, uh, the world we uh, society. Because we're still in this world. We still, you know, we still have our bodies. We still have consciousness. Consciousness in this uh, realm, so we still have to uh, finish off what we do before we uh, move on to the next. Any other questions? You were saying about how um, people always think of Buddhism as being a, um, a religion rather than philosophy. Like, how do you? Would you make it more practical in your daily life? Um, oh, and how do you make it more practical in your daily life? 
Yeah, I think it all comes back to the to the practice and being consistent. Um, and different people have uh, different ways of practicing. Uh, meditation, obviously, is, is one. Um, attending Dharma functions. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. Like the, the more you, for example, I, I really enjoy um, the Dharma function uh, because of you know just that um, the sound. Have you, everyone been to a Dharma function? Do you know what we're talking about? Or if you come on a Saturday morning, we do have Dharma functions here. Mm -hmm. So this is where we, we uh, do uh, our weekly assembly, where we um, um, basically do the chanting um, of, the, of the sutras. And, and through the, I guess the, the harmony and, and the sound, um, it actually keeps you focused. And sometimes, well for myself, you know, like if you, if you do it enough, then you saw it at the back of your mind. And I think some of these stuff are triggers. Um, it's a bit like when you ring a bell and the, and, and the dog uh, salivates, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it does have this um, um, sort of like reflex action. So really, yeah, I, I think it all comes down to try to get into your rhythm so that things become second nature, so you don't have to think. I think by the time you think, you're already processing, and that's not really your true self. Um, if it's a reflex action, if you see something, I mean, obviously, you know, if someone has fallen down, or someone needs help, you know, your first reaction, what do you do? You try to help them. Um, but, you know, that's the reactive one. But um, moving forward, of course, you have to think more proactive. You know, how do I actually um, uh, make sure that people, um, you know, don't, have these afflictions, but yeah, you know, it's coming back to um, having you know, discussion groups like this, actually having talks, uh, telling more people about Buddhism, uh, correcting people's views about Buddhism. So these are, well, I say, you know, these are the proactive parts, you know, so that every one of you will be on the right path, and then everyone will be able to enjoy life to the fullest and not to have fun. Yeah. Um, things that are caused by uh, your karma and your affliction. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.